Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Dot Dot Dot, the podcast that explores how to create meaningful art experiences in the built environment. I'm your host, Martha Weidman, the CEO and co-founder of Nine Dot Arts. Our guest today is Charles Pinkham, SVP of Development at Portman Holdings, and also a band member of PSP and the Dad Jokes. So if you're in town in Atlanta and you want to see a good show, definitely check them out. If you want to see more about his professional work in real estate development, you can check out Portman Holdings and Charles' LinkedIn page for a Charles Pinkham III. Today, Charles is going to share with us his perspective, being an Atlanta native, on how things have changed and new developments that they're looking at across the Southeast. I love his focus on target markets, looking for tier 1.5 cities and the opportunities that are available within those to create magic artistic moments within the confines of the project's boundaries. If you haven't already, be sure to download the State of the Art Report at the 9.Arts website, 9.Arts.com. This is the place where we bring heart and soul to the data of our survey, stories behind the numbers, the human element to the statistics, and you can definitely learn more about the ROI of art and culture by downloading that report. So stay tuned and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Dot 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 podcast, where we learn about art and culture and the impact on the built environment. Today, our guest is Charles Pinkham, a senior vice president with Portman Holdings. And Charles is joining us today from Atlanta. Thanks, Charles, for being on the show. It is my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. So tell us a little bit more about, uh, tell our listeners about who you are, what you do, and why it matters. So I uh, work for a company called Portman Holdings. Uh, We have been in business for, um, goodness, about 70 years. So we are a real estate investment and development firm. Uh, We were founded by an architect uh, in the early 50s. He started a firm with, um, actually with one of his old college professors. Um, And he found out pretty quickly, though, that it was pretty tough um, as a young guy uh, to get uh, design commissions. So he decided that if he could control the land and he could control the financing, then he knew who would get that design commission. So he started moving into the world of development, um, started with business to business trades. Um, and that really took off and uh, it led to more mixed use development, specifically here in downtown Atlanta. So he took that mixed use concept and Um, ultimately did large mixed-use projects with hotels and office buildings uh, and retail in San Francisco, in New York, um, in the 70s, took that overseas. Uh, We were one of the first developers in China um, and eventually found ourselves in India as well. Uh, But over the past 10 years, uh, it has moved from kind of a strictly family office uh, to one that's a little bit more collaborative. Um, and we now um, are run by our CEO, Ambrish Baisiwala, uh, in partnership with our president, John Portman IV. Um, and we have found ourselves really hyper-focused back on the United States over the past 10 years. And mostly in what I'll call tier 1.5 markets. Uh, so we find ourselves in Atlanta and Charlotte and Nashville, Denver, Seattle, Austin, Dallas, San Diego, et cetera. Um, and we like to work on large, uh, impactful mixed use projects that fit well within the context of the community. And so um, I've been doing this here with Portman for 15 years. Um, I'm very blessed to work a, in, a, in a great job with great people, uh, and I'm fortunate to love what I do. Well, that's super exciting. And tell, tell us a little bit more about some of the projects that you are actively involved in right now that uh, get you uh, excited to get out of bed in the morning. Um, I have recently finished uh, a large build a suit for Anthem Healthcare in Midtown Atlanta. That was actually a, um, a two-phase project, ultimately about 700,000 square feet of office. And that was really cool because not only was I building fun architecture, um, but I was doing it with a specific tenant in mind. And so I got to work with them, with their creative teams, their design teams, their operations teams to understand exactly what it is that they wanted and exactly what it is that they need um, and go build that for them. Um, So as opposed to, you know, a a typical office development where I'm kind of building a core and a shell and then I hand it over to tenants um, to do whatever they do, I, I got to do everything alongside with them. So every detail of that from the obvious, the architecture to uh, the interiors and exactly how all the public space flows together and various uh, artistic architectural elements, 
how that all tied into their themes and their businesses. Um, we, we really gave consideration to every little square inch of that building, and that was really fun to do. Um, I'm working now on a very large uh, master plan project in Dallas. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. It's, it's uh, multiple residential towers, office projects, um, and a, a lot of really cool kind of retail, entertainment, food and beverage fabric that runs throughout all of these. Um, I'm, I'm excited about the design team that uh, I'm working with on that. Um, and that should be pretty, pretty large, pretty robust, uh, very time demanding, but uh, a whole lot of fun and, and an opportunity to create kind of a, not a new full district, but certainly something new for Dallas that I don't think is there yet. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to see that move forward. And then I, I've got one project in uh, Charlotte that's an office tower um, that's right on the Blue Line Rail Trail. So very interactive, a really active ground floor full of food and beverage. Uh, we partnered with a, a large, very popular brewery called Sycamore in Charlotte uh, to build a new space for them and lots of outdoor terraces and interaction uh, with the public and with this rail trail. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about that one. And that's another kind of large office tower. Um, and we're doing a lot of those kinds of large uh, offices all around the country. Uh, but I'm also really excited about some of the smaller projects that we're doing. Um, two in particular, uh, one is a smaller office building that will have a lot of interaction here in Atlanta on the Beltline. And so the Beltline in Atlanta is like the High Line in New York, and uh, it's very heavily populated, uh, very well utilized, uh, lots of people walking, riding bikes, walking dogs, just interacting and socializing, uh, lots of food and beverage and entertainment all up and down this. And we're going to build one of the first uh, delivered office spaces, and it's so much smaller than we usually do, which is really fun because it gives us the opportunity to be very detailed, very specific, very design-led. Um, and because of the fact that we were born out of an architecture, we like to think that for developers, we, we have a heavy focus on design, uh, but this one even more so just because it's about 130,000 square feet, and most of what we do is you know, 400,000 or 500,000. So we get to get, we, we have the opportunity to be very granular with this project, uh, which is pretty cool. And it's going to be low rise and lots of outdoor terracing, lots of interaction with the public. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, and then finally, it, it just in terms of those that immediately come to mind, I've got um, a redevelopment in Charlotte. Um, it's a little bit outside of downtown. It is 188,000 square foot uh, old historic mills, and that 188,000 square feet is on two and a half floors. So it's these huge, expansive floor plans uh, with 20 foot ceilings and lots of old timber everywhere and um, old um, light fixtures and things to that effect. So a lot of uh, historic elements in there, and we're going to have an opportunity to redevelop that into some really cool creative office space, um, a lot of outdoor space. There happens to be another um, uh, kind of walking trail along a creek that is very nearby on the property um, that we can tie into. And it, it's going to be something that I, I think is going to revitalize a, a growing neighborhood. Um, and so we, we get the opportunity to interact with community leaders there and um, bring them into discussions of what kind of amenities and retail we bring into the space. And ultimately, we're going to build some very low rise residential um, on 22 acres of land that is adjacent to this historic mill and, and really create a, a, a neighborhood. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited about that one. It's, it's going to be done over the course of a few years, um, but it's something that now on the forefront, we're able to work with the community leaders and, and understand what it is that they need and, and want, but also make sure that we maintain uh, the character of that space and involve them in the development itself. So it's a very cool project. I'm, I'm excited to see that one uh, come to fruition, and hopefully we start construction on that uh, first of next year. Well, it's exciting to hear about your impact on, as you call it, the tier 1.5 cities. That's a great term. I might borrow that sometime because those are the cities that are growing, right? We've seen this move from the big megalopolis cities and the place places where people are growing now and the real accelerator during the past two years has been to those markets that for many are more affordable, more attractive and have a scale 
uh, that people really enjoy. So kudos to you on a number of exciting transformations around the United States. Uh, I'm curious to know that redevelopment project in Charlotte, what was the prior industrial use for the building? Um, they were textile mills. Um, and so the, the first one, I think, was built about 105 years ago, and this group expanded it twice. So there are really three buildings that have been connected, um, but it was all textile mill use um, of varying uh, specifics over the years. Uh, it has housed some small-scale office um, as much as maybe 20 years ago, but largely uh, textile mill focused. So lots of old weave mills, um, very cool stuff. There's a lot of really um, old tools and things that are still there. Um, so a lot of really cool moments throughout these buildings, um, and we'll have the opportunity to preserve a lot of that character as we build out the space and, and modernize it. Well, another uh, piece that we haven't yet talked about is the art and branding, what role art and culture play in the work that you do. And what's so interesting is that not only was the foundation of your company, one coming from this design oriented firm that knows architecture and development, but also art. Uh, because John Portman is an artist as well. So tell us about the role art and culture play in the work that you do and how does that influence a project? Uh, that's a great question. And, you know, to, to me, art and culture um, really is everything. It, it is to me personally in so many ways. Um, but for us as a company, as it relates to our work, um, it, it's everything. Because, I mean, culture of an area um, is really what defines the story of a project. And whether it's a hotel or an office tower or um, uh, residences or you know ribbons of restaurants and entertainment, whatever it is, it, any urban development of substance has to speak to its surroundings. And, and the alternative is really just to build you know another building without any character um, that will be outdated and obsolete in a matter of years. And so, you know, art feeds into this um, in a major way as it provides those moments of connection and life and brightness and emotion that everybody can experience, not just, um, you know, the people who are going to work in a given building or just the people who live in a given building or just the people who are staying for a night or two in a given building. It, it gives opportunities for the public to, um, to see something that's approachable on a human scale and um, and, and art also is that connective tissue between, you know, the inside of a building and its surrounding context, because uh, it has an opportunity to be much larger than just the physical object that it is in a way that a building itself, maybe it can, maybe it can't, but art always is. So I, I think that it's, it's vital in terms of building um, um, a quality project that really interacts and connects to the community um, that that culture and, and art and how that plays in, it's, it's an absolutely vital element uh, that has to be considered from day one. There's culture, there's connective tissue, there's bringing the soul of the community into the space. And then, you know, of course, building a brand identity, you know, something that the building becomes known for, that the project becomes known for. So how about, uh, can you tell us about a project where the artwork has been central to communicating that storyline and an example of what that looks like or feels like? Yes, absolutely. And the first one that comes to mind is um, what we actually did together in Denver. So um, just for, for the listeners, so in, in Denver, uh, I built a office and hotel mixed use building. Um, and in this project, a big part of the hotel was telling the story of the surrounding neighborhood. And that became a narrative, which literally became a book, which went to hotel rooms. And so as we were researching that, we found that in the immediate surrounding area, and I had no idea, frankly, um, long, long, long ago, there was a large gold rush in Denver, not too dissimilar from what uh, was experienced in California uh, in the mid uh, 19th century. And so we found that um, we found a lot of historic elements and a lot of historic maps and and features and where people were um, in Cherry Creek and farming for gold and, and using tools of wood and metal and setting up uh, campgrounds and things to that effect. And so we knew that we wanted to bring art into the project. Um, and the question was, what does it want to be? And, and there's always opportunities for, for, for painting, for sculpture. And we thought that sculpture would be kind of the way, the best way to speak to all this, because we knew that 
our interior design would have elements of painting and, and imagery and things to that effect. And so ultimately, you guys brought to us um, a, a lot of different opportunities, and I was immediately struck. Um, I remember uh, Molly showed me this this uh, it was just a picture of a wooden structure and it was a p it was a piece of wood and it, there was actually two of them and so we knew that they were married together but it was wood that was kind of found in its natural form and it was um it was shaped a, a bit but kind of kept its natural form but um was glazed or covered or um what have you just to give it you know certain color and certain textures but it was infused with metal and it was very large and it was very prominent and it's not something that you could pass by without looking at it uh because it was very imposing um but it was also very perfect because it felt very natural and kind of felt like a you know what you might see in the historical setting and so i remember i went to look at it at the artist studio which was which was local and um, like a good salesman, he had that one that I had kind of pre-selected married to um, another one uh, that was kind of like its twin. It was, it, or I should say it was its sibling because they both came out of the same uh, wooden tree. And as soon as I saw it, I said, we've got to have both. And so we, we did that and we were able to put it and actually build this huge rotunda that linked the hotel lobby to the restaurant. So it creates this this incredible moment that's still there of um, this huge wooden structure that's infused with metal and it's just beautiful and it's so perfectly crafted. And it reminds me not only of, you know, what the surroundings during this gold rush must have looked like from just kind of trees and things to that effect, but it's also kind of a combination of materials of the various tools that they were using at the time. So it really spoke perfectly to me um, to the story that, uh, kind of came out of the immediately surrounding areas, flowed through the hotel. And it's also just a very stunning piece of sculpture that I immediately fell in love with. Um, so I, I think it was it was the perfect fit. Uh, and I'm so glad that you guys had brought that to us. And um, it, it it's still there. And frankly, every time I'm in Denver, I go by and I just have to put my eyes on it and sit with it for a few minutes. That's a good segue into community engagement. You've talked a little bit about that when you were describing what you're working on at the textile mills in Charlotte, engaging the community and thinking about what happens next. And beyond, you know, ROI or what you could put on a, a, a spreadsheet or a financial statement, uh, what sort of value do you think art and culture have and you know, on the long term, particularly in, in a business environment? How do you think about justifying uh, that that kind of art and social impact and and community engagement. Uh, it, it's really important, um, and and I mean that's an obvious answer, but it's very true because, you know, I I said earlier that when you have a piece of art in a project, um, it brings you know emotion to the space and and it helps people connect to it, um, and and connect to the art, which is a piece of the total building in a way that they may not necessarily be able to just connect with a new piece of architecture, which. Is, is somewhat subjective. Some people like it, some people don't. And it's the same way with art, but art has kind of more of a personal appeal. And so, you know, that helps to make a connection to a space. It helps to bring down walls. Um, a lot of times you go past buildings, which, you know, at the end of the day, or despite the architecture, they are, um, you know, it's concrete and steel and wood, and it's, it's, it's thrown together. And sometimes it can be a little bit harsh, and sometimes it can look um, like a fortress. And sometimes because the walls are so big and the doors are so big, um, it can look like something that's very imposing and that you're not supposed to be there. Or it can be very over the top and very luxurious and look almost exclusive. But if you have a piece of art there that really speaks to the community, there's a connection and a moment there um, that helps to kind of make those walls penetrable and make it accessible. And it makes things look less imposing. And so I, I think it's really important to ensure that you're bringing that culture and that art into the space um, that speaks to the community and and allows a building to connect to its surroundings as opposed to just being something that's plopped down in the middle that's only for the users of that building. It, it helps to make those uh, connections to the people. And I think that that's vital uh, for having something that's going to be lasting and it's going to be of substance um, and that people are going to uh, want to be a part of. 
Well, that's uh, certainly a, a way to think about it that is outside the box, right? Outside of necessarily what you might put down in a number, but think about more long-term, you know, long-term community engagement. What value does that have for a place? And I think about art and culture in some ways as being this um, concept of placemaking, creating places where people want to be. I know creative placemaking is a bit of a buzzword right now, but it's a concept that's becoming more and more mainstream. What does that concept mean to you? And and what role do you think you know, culture plays um, in that when you're thinking early stage concepting about a project? Um, it, it's it, it's crucial. And so the way that we look at uh, projects just from an early stage, we always we, we have our site and we, we know kind of where we want to be in a city. But once we identify a site that we think there's an opportunity on, we'll, we'll put that site in the middle of concentric circles. And we always start on the outside. And we always look at the surrounding community. And we'll go out a long way. I mean, we'll go citywide, start at the edges, and then we walk our way into the site. And we do this through master planning charrettes. Um, usually with multiple designers, we like to bring in, you know, our landscape architects and, and even our interior designers um, on the get go. And we'll do all of this as kind of a creative unit. And so we'll start on the outside. We, we think it's essential to understand the community, understand the context, and then we fit our design into that as opposed to coming with the design and then d- determining how then to reach outward. We want to start on the outside and then go inward. And so our design responds to that. And so um, placemaking then becomes an element of that because that that is what um, it, that that really is the space in between the buildings, which frankly is the most important in so many ways. It, it especially with office buildings and big towers, the vertical design it, it's not easy. It's very complicated, but it it'll take care of itself if you have good design teams and you've thought contextually about the space in between the buildings. When you're thinking about concentric circles and listening and understanding what people there want and what people are looking for, are there some benefits that you hope to offer to the community where your projects are located or any particular themes? We right now are really focused on uh, community interaction uh, through activity. And so a lot of our projects right now are um, along rail trails and connective tissues that are linking one place to another and, and linked with, you know, the outdoors and people being active and engaged and, um, and, and linking to people who may or may not actually be part of our project. Um, and, and that way we feel like it kind of, it sits along connective tissue that not only connects our building to its immediate surrounding area, but also to, um, the balance of uh, of the city or of the community. Well, going through all these steps, you know, finding out who are the neighboring entities, how do you tie in with them, thinking about the broader community, listening, design charrettes, all of this involves a great deal of collaboration, which is an amazing thing and can have huge outcomes. But efficiency is also important when you're trying to meet a deadline. So how do you balance collaboration with efficiency? Um, well, you know, you, you've got to be very conscious of the importance of collaboration and, and you have to allow for that amount of time, especially on the front end, um, that it takes to get that done. And so usually, you know, you have your design schedules and you say, all right, concept takes two months and, and, you know, SD takes this and DD takes this, and that's all fine and good. Um, and I think that that's important because you do need to be efficient and you do need to, there, there is a business and there is an investment there. But leading up to that, there is master planning and consideration that absolutely has to happen. And there's engagement that needs to happen on the front end um, to ensure that the context is there before you even start concept. And it's important to do it on the front end because if you don't, you'll end up doing it on the back end and you'll disrupt your flow. And that, frankly, is more um, damaging to a project, uh, disrupting a you know a, a moving um, a project that's moving, disrupting that, and you know having to inject time in and redesign and redraw. If you collaborate and you're uh, you're creative and thoughtful on the front end, then you set your uh, project along a path 
um, which it can go in a very efficient manner. So it's important to have that vision and that collaboration on the front end so you know what it is that your project ultimately wants to um, wants to do and wants to create. Early engagement is key. Like that example that we were talking about earlier, you know, we were building designing sculptures that fit right in with the architectural detail of a place. And we were talking before we got on on live about how it's never too early to start thinking about art and culture impacts. And one of the questions that I commonly get is how do we how do we come up with a budget at the early stage of a project, right? So how do you go about thinking about it? And what are your considerations come to mind when you're thinking about when, when to start concepting around the artwork and the culture plan, who needs to be involved and how much to budget? So the way that I like to think about it is when we start with, you know, the context and we drill down to the master plan and then we start to look at the building itself, the question then starts to become, you know, how is this building linked to the community? How does this building link to the outside? What's happening in the first 30 feet or so of this building? And then you start to identify uh, your lobbies and your more open interior spaces, and you also identify those open outdoor spaces, whether it's hardscape plaza or green spaces or what have you. And then working with landscape architects, working with your interior designers, working with your architects, you identify where these moments are going to be. So what really helps to drive an art budget is how many of those moments do you have? And it really doesn't matter how big the project is, vertically, square feet, that, that's not important. What, what's important is um, how many of these moments there are and how many of these moments are necessary. And, and it depends on the surrounding area because some buildings have a clear front door. Um, this building we're doing on the Beltline in Atlanta has three front doors. I mean, it, it is it is almost all, and frankly, you could argue that there's just no back door. It's all sides. And so those are all elements. So, you know, I've got five or six moments for, um, for engagement with art in this Beltline project, um, even though it's 130,000 square foot, uh, square feet, excuse me. For these buildings, um, you know, a half a million square feet in, um, in Midtown in a very kind of tight urban setting, you probably have a front door. So you have, so that's your moment. So the art budget for, you know, your half a million square foot tower um, in Midtown Atlanta may be much smaller than that for a significantly smaller project, you know, on the Beltline. And so it, it really is about identifying those moments and then understanding what it is that you want to do there uh, to tie in. And so, you know, you, you have that number of moments. Maybe you want to put, you know, a, a lump sum against each moment. But it, it's important that you, you look at it in the context of the design and in the context of the surrounding neighborhood, as opposed to just saying, well, here's my budget and I need, you know, $200,000 for art. That, that, will, that will rarely work. You're either going to be way over or more often than not way under. So in your industry, are you seeing trends that you think will impact the way you work or the way you do business in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the post-COVID world, I think, um, is more similar to the pre-COVID world ultimately um, than I think a lot of people were talking about, you know, a year ago. Um, I do think that, frankly, the the population of the world, especially in the United States, has a has a pretty short memory in a lot of respects. Um, and we're seeing people get back to the office in a pretty significant way now. Um, that said, there there are some substantial changes that we're working into our architecture. We are focused on um, a lot more outdoor space. Um, we are focused on uh, terraces that are part of the public space within a building, but also can be utilized um, or designated as part of a tenant's private space as well. Um, we are focused on more collaborative areas and not to bunch people together, but to allow them to, you know, sit in larger, more open spaces as opposed to boardrooms. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of creating those, those um, uh, meeting spaces where it used to be just, you know, a large underutilized lobby. Um, we're trying to be more creative with utilization of those spaces. So I, I think, you know, we have we are focusing on utilization of open space and of outdoor space within the context of our projects. Um, and, and frankly, with with office buildings in particular, 
we're finding that those elements are making their way into everything that we're designing or in pre-development for now. And I think that that is something that's going to stick uh, for the foreseeable future. So I think people, frankly, are going to use office space. Uh, people, I, I don't think that the pure work, work from home um, trend is going to dominate. Um, I think that people will go back to the office, but I think that that office space may look a little bit different than it used to. Can you tell us about a piece of artwork or a personal art experience, maybe a concert or a play or architecture or museum visit that made an impression on you or was especially memorable? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, there, there's a few and some are more, some are more personal and some are kind of cliche, but I'll tell you, you know, about, about those anyway. So um, I, um, I started listening to, uh, music in, in kind of my own music, as opposed to, you know, my parents' music, um, when I was really, really young and, and it started for me with, um, Led Zeppelin and with Rush. Um, and so Led Zeppelin and Rush were two rock bands, um, that had very prolific drummers and they got me, that music got me into drums. And so I started playing drums when I was, um, 11 and I started playing, um, I played my first concert when I was 12 years old and I played, um, at the new Daisy theater with a band, uh, a band called Merrill. So I think I was in sixth grade and, you know, the, the rest of the band was in high school and my mom was freaking out cause I'm playing, you know, at this concert on Beale street in downtown Memphis. And she's saying, what is my you know, young child doing here? But, um, that, that was hugely impactful on me because that really, uh, stimulated, uh, my love for music and, 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 I mean, at that time, I was 12 years old. I think I got paid $100 to play music for 45 minutes in front of, you know, 200 of our closest friends. And I decided then and there, I didn't need to go back to school. I was obviously going to be a rock star if I could get paid for this. Um, that's something that that still sticks with me. And I still play. I still, I'm in a, I mean, I'm 40 now. So I'm in a, I'm just in a dad band. Uh, but we, you know, we play covers and go play gigs and, um, and it's a lot of fun. So that that very first concert, I, I remember it so well. Um, on on the art side, um, you know, <laughs> I, it, it's so cliche to say, but um, um, the uh, the Dorsey in Paris, um, I had an opportunity to go to Paris uh, with my wife uh, a few years back, and I, I've always been a big fan of art. Uh, I had a teacher in elementary school. Her name was Miss Glick. And she was the art teacher and she had, she introduced art to us at a very young age. And she was very, uh, she was very specific about what we saw and what she exposed us to. And, um, and, and so I've always really enjoyed that, but going to see those um, impressionism works in person and being able to see the texture of the paintings um, is something that I'll, uh, that, that left a, an incredible impression on me. Um, and I mean, so much so that, I have, I went and bought all kinds of prints and they litter my office. Um, I have one next to my bed. There's this, um, there's this specific Van Gogh. Um, it's, it's the gray hat self portrait and like the details around his eyes, for whatever reason, I find it just incredibly stimulating, incredibly inspiring. So I've actually got, I've got a print of that next to my desk and I've got a print of that, um, next to my bed. And I, it's actually the the screensaver on my cell phone. And this was years ago that I was at this museum, but it, it's had a big impression on me and just how I interact with art and um, what I see and look for in art. Um, and it's uh, it's something that sticks with me. And fortunately, my kids have gotten really interested in too at a pretty young age. Uh, so those are, those are kind of two things that really jump out, um, as well as a bunch of Foo Fighters concerts, because those guys put on some of the best shows you'll ever see in your life. Amazing. What's the name of your band? Uh, <laughs> so it's ridiculous. So, uh, it's called PSP and the dad jokes. So PSP is the, is our last name. It's our, it's the initials of our last name. And, you know, we're sitting there and we're saying, you know, so that that's fine, but it's gotta be, and the something, um, that's, that's just how, what it needs to be. It needs to be some, you know, really bad, really stupid dad joke. And that just stuck. So the band is PSP and the dad jokes. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's so cool. I had no idea that we were working with a professional musician. I cannot wait to, to see you sometime. Uh, that would be great. That would be great. We can come play in Denver. Awesome. Well, Charles, thank you so much for being on the show today. It was great to hear your perspective about how to build communities, how to stay engaged, and really use 
uh, art and culture as a way to create connective tissue between the buildings that you're creating and making an environment that caters to the spaces in between the buildings. That's really about the people who visit there. So thanks for your work in community building, in city building, and being a thoughtful and conscientious developer. Uh, We're excited about what you've got going on and look forward to seeing the places you build next. Thanks, Charles. Well, thanks for tuning in for today's episode of Dot, Dot, Dot. And to keep up with our latest, be sure to subscribe to Nine Dot Arts on YouTube or to Dot, 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 wherever you get your podcasts. Do you have feedback or ideas for the show? Well, email us at letstalk at nine.arts.com. And until next time, on behalf of everyone at Nine Dot Arts, here's wishing you some inspiring art experiences.